Thank you everybody for coming. I didn't expect so many people. This is really good. Um, welcome to Site Search. It is a relevance case study. Um, my name is uh, Dominic Milburn. I'm a solutions, I'm a contract solution architect, and I've been working in the digital industry for about 14 years now. I've had the opportunity to implement uh, site search on all manner, all sizes of businesses. I've had the opportunity to um, uh, develop custom search solutions in, in various different content management systems. And I've always also had the, uh, had the opportunity to implement um, paid and open source third party site search products on the site search. Now, Today, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the types of site search there is available to, uh, for search. We're going to have a little uh, examination of a case study that I, I, I was recently involved in. And also, hopefully, I'll discuss some of the tactics I employ when I deal with the implementation for site search. And with a little bit of luck, you'll be able to take away some of these um, uh, lessons and apply them to your own projects and that sort, those sorts of things. Okay, um, I wanted to share some observations of what I've learned over the, over the last few years of implementing search, is that everybody wants Google. Doesn't matter what they say, they all go, oh, I, want, I need to have Google on my site. However, the problem is, that's really expensive. Google spent millions and millions of dollars on their algorithms, so it's, it's far too expensive, but they all really, really like and say, I want Google, give us Google, give me Google. Unfortunately, what happens is too costly. Now, um, in addition to that, what you find is search, particularly on-site search, is the first thing to get, that gets neglected once, um, once the deadline hits or when the, the scope starts to, um, when the go live uh, starts to come along. You, you, it's the first thing that gets um, missed and starts to, it starts to crunch. The other thing is that it tends to be a very black box, black box issue. What happens is people get a little bit nervous about it. It's kind of like you've got this index and nobody really quite knows what goes in. You throw some keywords at it and all of a sudden it gets some uh, results and nobody re quite knows what goes on under the, under the hood. So people tend to be a bit confused about it. Hopefully I should be able to um, share my experience and provide you with a little less of that black box experience. So, there are essentially two types of on-site search. There's pattern matching and what, I could, what we refer to as a relevance engine. So, pattern matching is essentially what you do is you take a keyword and you throw it to the index and then what it does, it goes through the index and matches that keyword against the, specific, against the documents in the index and increases the count by one however many matches there is. Now, the more matches in that result, the higher the, the item gets uh, shown and displayed in the, in the result set. This is, typically what ha this is typically an out of the box search solution. A lot of uh, pattern matching, a lot of out of the box CMSs use pattern matching algorithms. Um, it's also a very quick and cost effective method of implementing an on-site search but it's not wonderfully sexy. I'm not a great big fan of pattern matching. Um, the reason why it can result in a really poor user experience. We've, already, we've all seen the result set where you're kind of like, how on earth did that result get up to the top of the list based on that keyword? There's no visibility about how, to, um, uh, how that result set gets um, returned. So it can be quite um, a poor user experience. The other thing is that pattern matching is typically a very, it's kind of a costly exercise to be able to manipulate it. If you want to customize it or, um, or modify any of the search, particularly when, it's, when it comes to pattern matching, is it tends to be quite costly to change and also it enables to incur technical debt as well, because you've got to manipulate the core and, and mess around with it. Now, on the other side of the search, we've got this relevance, relevance engine. Now, relevance engine is kind of like the Google experience. What happens is uh, you do a search, somebody else does a search, they click on results, 
uh, the algorithm then smushes it all together, figures out what, what is the most uh, effective result and spits back the results. So it's all based on a, a more intelligent algorithm rather than just pattern matching. Now, typically these, uh, uh, um, excuse me, relevance engine is, comes as a third party product. It comes as a software as a service. Um, they can vary between open source and proprietary engines. And however, they can be very expensive. Um, there's some really, really expensive um, third party products out there that could range like license fees of uh, was about 30 to 50K a year. So they're very, they can be quite costly. However, the good thing is that they are a wonderful user experience, both for the user that's actually using a search and for the business owners that have the opportunity to manipulate, manipulate the search and manage the index. Um, and you don't need developer assistance to be able to manage that, uh, the index. And one thing about being a, uh, it tends to be with proprietary as well as open source with, um, relevance engines is they're very easy to customize as well. They provide you with uh, support files and APIs and that sort of thing that you can just manipulate and theme uh, however you want, okay? Now, we've had the opportunity to talk about the types of search we use. I wanna introduce the case study. Now, um, this case study, I was involved in the building of a, um, uh, website for, uh, with on-site search. It was a very large implementation. It was large for a large law firm of about 150 partners. Now, this uh, case study, um, I'll just highlight some of the uh, user requirements that we had for uh, this uh, project. So first up, People needed to be, because it's a law firm, it requires a lot of partners and they uh, are built, uh, law firms are built on the individual's expert expertise. So they needed to be able to be, the people in the organization need to be ranked through multiple capabilities. So they need to be able to be targeted through family law or uh, uh, mergers and acquisition or uh, lots of multiple uh, skill sets. They wanted to, the business wanted to be able to tweak the result set according to the business needs. So they, it's, they kind of wanted to be able to inject um, uh, inject results into the top of the list with uh, based on their business requirements. They also needed to provide support for synonyms. Not everybody searches on the same terms, so they need to be able to get get that kind of support. The results should be faceted, so the, the different sections and categorizations of search. Um, the budget was quite low as well, particularly when it came to search. The, bu the whole site was, uh, budget was fairly tight and we need to have it, have it delivered within six weeks in time for a conference. They want to do, um, launch this new website with the search algorithm in time for the conference. So the, the partners can go away to the conference, hand out cards and the, uh, the people at the conference can come back and search their names on the, on the, on the site. Okay, so, and they also, <laughs> what they also wanted, they said, we want Google. <laughs> So it's like, okay, no, no time, little budget, but you want Google, right, okay. So the first challenge was actually to implement a relevance uh, engine. How, do we, how are we gonna do that? So for this uh, search service. So the first thing we, do, we, we asked was, can we develop this in-house? And the answer was no, we can't. Why? It was just too costly. Uh, every, the, uh, the development time involved to create indexing, creating search manipulation, faceted results, it was just too pricey. So we thought, okay, we're not gonna build it, we might as well find a, uh, we need to look at third party s s suppliers. Now these guys said they wanted Google. So we're like, okay, we'll go to Google. Perfect, site search. And then this happened. <laughs> April 2018, we suddenly realized it was discontinued. It was about, uh, so we panicked. We went, oh no, what are we gonna do? What are we, uh, we kind of panicked and went, oh God. And then after a while, we calmed down a little bit and then expanded our search to the wider market, okay? And what we found 
was there are loads and loads of search products out there. However, the majority of them come at a cost. They are really, really expensive, which didn't help us, right? It, it, wasn't, not, it wasn't very, uh, uh, it was very difficult to find a, a very costly, cost-effective um, search solution. So we, we fine-tuned our search and uh, searched a bit more and searched a little more, more. And then we found these, we whittled them down and found these five products. Now these are all software as a solution um, products and they also meet the cross cross cost criteria. These five products all are able to maintain index for under $1,200 per annum, which is very, very cheap when it comes to um, uh, site search. So um, after, a few wit uh, after a few decisions, we uh, eventually decided on Swift type for implementation, okay? So um, if you, these will all, these search products will all meet the um, uh, uh, content requirements, faceted search, provide the ability to ma manipulate the index. They all provide e very effective um, uh, statistics engines and that sort of thing. So in summary, we want to talk about some of the key takeaways that I had from this search is when looking at a relevance engine, don't build it yourself. It's just too expensive and people have already done it before. I know it can be a quite sexy technical challenge, but it's just too costly to be able to implement it yourself. Also, third party products provide visibility of the index. They're really, really effective to provide an understanding of what goes on in that index and what goes on uh, and why those results are returned to you for specific keywords. And finally, these products allow you to manipulate the results. They allow you, let's say you've got a particular keyword and you need to get, inject a, uh, a service or a very key important document into your, uh, uh, into your, at the top of your list so you can, you can move that customer onto the, that journey. That's what these products are great at doing, okay? So, challenge number two. We've made a decision, we've got our search engine, we knew it was a critical success factor and the next stage was dealing with the unexpected. So, first of all, we knew search was a, a critical success factor. It was vital for this um, site to be, uh, to be successful. And so we're like, yeah, that's cool, we'll do that. So the first thing we did was create this search engine, develop this search engine on a test environment and it was humming, it was perfect. We, we tested it with test data, it came out with lots of information. It was brilliant. We're like, whoo, pass on the back, job done, Close, drop mic, leave the room, that's it. But there was a problem, right? When we got to UAT testing and we actually started to test with real life data, the client was like, this, this is not matching our expectations. We're not getting the relevant information from the uh, information you saw. They uh, were not, me we're not meeting their business cases. They're not, we weren't meeting their business, business uh, requirements for the search, which was kind of like really, really scary because we were, um, <laughs> we were a couple of days away from launching this site and this was the first time we had the opportunity to actually test with real life content. And so the client started to lose confidence. So just like, oh, we, we can't have this search. We, 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 this search has to be right before we, um, uh, before we go. So we had to postpone the launch, unfortunately. Um, what we did then was the key, a couple of key takeaways for this is what I would suggest is factoring time to, to uh, test out your search with live data. Nothing is a substitute for live data. And if you can't do that, manage your expectations. Tell the business users, if we have a search and we don't have time to test it, post launch, we have to tweak it. We have to fine tune that, uh, that search. Then coming up to challenge number three. Now, we had to postpone the launch. We knew we search didn't meet the requirements. So what we did, the client said they wanted relevance. We implemented relevance. However, when we came to do the testing, relevance was not quite what they wanted. 
So what we did, we spun up a bunch of um, uh, rapid pro prototypes, um, lightweight that we could quickly test and figure out what they what they actually wanted when they um, uh, when we implemented, and we found that what the search they wanted was this thing called fuzzy search. Now, fuzzy search is kind of like a um, pattern matching algorithm that's kind of like a spell checker. It kind of looks at variances for um, all the closest words. It's kind of like what um, Word and Google use when you're, uh, when you're uh, doing autocorrect and spell check. So we figured that out. We got that. We implemented that, which was like, whew, got that done. And um, what I want to also highlight with these, some of the key takeaways with this challenge was don't be afraid to get it wrong. We got it wrong. We had to postpone the launch. However, we, it gave us some more clarity around what we needed to do and provided us with more clarity to find the success factor. Sometimes it's OK to get it wrong to be able to get it right. And also, what I've also found is pattern matching is an acceptable uh, criteria. We spent all this effort getting this relevant engine only to find actually pattern matching solution is more effective. And we could have found that out had we done that sort of iterative development at the start. So in summary, for in terms of the case study, we didn't get the site live in uh, six weeks. We got it li live in eight weeks. However, we got it live in time for the conference. So there was lot there, everybody was happy. The site's been live for about nine months. It's a great user experience for search. And uh, we've seen an increased um, uh, up uplift in search conversions because they have the ability to inject these, um, uh, these ad words into the, uh, into the index. Um, we're still tweaking with the search and improving the experience. However, we're using the analytics from the third party search to be able to um, uh, uh, tweak that engine and get, the, uh, get better search results. And so in summary, I just want to leave you with three key points. First, all, first up is allow yourself time to fine tune the results with real content. Factor that in. That is vital when it comes to search because you've got to put contingency into, into the project plan. Second, when it comes to relevance, third party products are the way to go. Don't, don't try and build one yourself. It's, it's just a waste of time and it's too costly. And then third, remember to bring the business along your search journey. Consult them. Show them things that get wrong. That way you can refine your um, understanding of those, so those requirements and refine the model so you're managing their expectations and they bring, they're brought along with that journey. And that's everything. I want to thank you for coming and listening to me talk today. Um, do you have any questions? Um, the, uh, why we selected uh, Swift type over Elasticsearch? Or, well, it's partly down to cost. Um, the other um, applications were um, a slightly higher cost uh, ratio. It's still under budget, but that was, it. and also their ability to inject um, uh, items into the ind index was a lot, a uh, lot more sophisticated than the other products. So with these kind of um, uh, web, websites, because it's a greenfield development, we didn't have the actual content. It, mm -hmm. It's usually what happens when you develop these uh, developer sites, it's the last thing to come. The development isn't the tricky bit. It's getting everybody to write the content. So it just wasn't there. It was, we had to write all the profiles and create all the insights and all that sort of stuff. So we didn't have the data at the time. Um, hey, what was the calculating in the, yield, in the annual fees? The what was calculating? What's calculating? Um, uh, they're, it's a subscription. They're subscription-based services. They're usually based on uh, the amount of documents you create. So uh, an index. Typically, those were all under about fi uh, 50, uh, 50,000 documents for uh, for indexing. And then also, they 
uh, charge on um, API calls as well. So if you, as soon as you throw a call to the index, that's counted as one API call. So you've got to be careful if you're doing autocomplete. So each keystroke is an API call. So you just got to be careful about that. But the, those are the kind of lowest tier um, subscription models. They, uh, they have a little bit of a leap after that, but you've got a lot more API calls and index uh, document indexes. OK. All right. Thank you. Oh. Um, you mentioned that you guys built some lightweight prototyping to test out a kind of search that you, mm -hmm. the client wants. Was that with real data? Uh, yes, yes. And what, what method or what tools did you use to build this um, library? Oh, it was very, very simple um, uh, JavaScript al algorithms. We applied some Jav JavaScript algorithms. That's how we established whether it was we needed to use uh, fuzzy search. So we c it was just a um, very, very lightweight hitting the index quite quickly. What we found, it was the... Um, it wasn't the relevance engine that, we, that was the problem. It was how it was returned. It was kind of like how it be, sent the data into the, into the API. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks.